Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the second to last edition of the Mike Wills Podcast. Well, more so, it's the last, second to last edition of the Dog Days of Podcasting edition of the Mike Wills Podcast. This is August 30th, 2019, and uh, I am WX0MIK and uh, otherwise known as Mike Wills. So we are on the last chapter and we are one day shy of going through the entire um, series. Uh, not without some scars, if you want to call it that, of missing a, not so much, quote, missing, because uh, I have produced a audio every single day. It's more of for, forgetting or not have time to edit the audio to get it published. <clears throat> Thus the fun and, quote, the challenge. Last night, I just kind of fell asleep on the couch, and boom. I <laughs> Next thing I knew, it was like 3 o'clock, and I was like, well, I'm just going right to bed now. I'll deal with publishing the next day. So, and I obviously haven't done that one yet either, but we're going to get this one recorded and published late as well. <laughs> uh, almost done. So, uh, today we are covering uh, mechanical safety. This is probably kind of the most important thing in this whole book. And it's only important if it's relevant to you. But um, I'll explain that in a second here. So uh, the first thing that they really are talking about is make sure to follow your manufacturer's directions and recommendations. Uh, for example, how tight should your guy right wires be? Maybe you're putting up a tower and you need to you make sure your guide wires are tight uh they'll tell you what what you need to do you just got to follow it to spec um so putting up antennas and supports before you start you should make sure your your plans satisfy any local zoning codes or covenants or restrictions in your deed or lease if you're putting up a very tall tower 200 feet or higher or the antenna will be near an airport. Check rules about the maximum height of structures near an airport. The FAA and FCC have special regulations about towers in these locations. This book is also out of date. Uh, the FCC now has other special rules to where you may need to do this for shorter towers as well. Um... I guess my recommendation is if it's over like 50 feet, I would start checking with the FAA and FCC just to make sure you're good. Um, that's a sideline that was not in here. Um, but it's something that was talked about here much more recently. Um, when you put up your antenna, look carefully to make sure that they look, basically look for a, uh, Supporting structures it may require. Um, also be careful that you're not near um, any overhead power lines. Uh, typically, the recommendation is uh, the, the total height of the mast and antenna plus 50%. So if you're putting up a 50-foot antenna or 50-foot mast and a, let's just say, a 10-foot antenna at 60 feet, you better be... 90 feet away from power lines. Just make sure you don't touch them. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is just make sure animals don't get caught in feed lines with any headgear. Typically, trees can also be used as wire supports. Um, however, if you do decide to do that, uh, make sure that people are clear of uh, the trees when you're trying to throw up uh, some the wire up there or uh, wait to pull the wire up there. Um, also 
be, re, do remember, this is not in the book, that trees sway in wind. So you may want to put do some something to make sure that it doesn't bend over your pole because the tree starts swinging in heavy wind. Uh, maybe like a, a spring or a pulley system is a couple different examples people have used in the past. Um, towers should always be grounded with a separate eight foot long grounding rod for each tower leg. And a small antenna mesh should be grown with a heavy wire and ground rod. So, you know, when you start getting that big, you need to worry about grounding and stuff like that. Um, they have an entire book on grounding. I did just here tonight, and that actually helped me a lot. Um, I plan on putting my antenna up here hopefully tomorrow. And... Um, so if I get that done, or if I do that, I am going to record some sort of a video. I hope to God it comes out good. And I will use that as my final episode of this series. So you're, you're going to be brought along here. And I, I've i already built the antenna portion, so I won't have video of that. But I'll, I'll, I'll show it in the video, of course. Um. So tower work and climbing safety. So before I cover this, um, I want to point out one thing. Since I have been following ham radio, which is May-ish, um, you know, at least seriously following ham radio news and all that stuff, three people have died in tower accidents, um, at least, it, Three people, one injured. That's what I remember for sure. There might have even been one more. They're dangerous. I mean, you're you're climbing up 20, 30, 40 feet in the air. And short, you have your safety equipment, which they mentioned in the book. And the guy wires keeping you up there. Without that, you're falling. And uh, in one case, the tower, they were taking it down, I believe. And they did not inspect the foot of the antenna or the mast. If they would have, they would have realized that it was rusty and it probably almost rusted all the way through. And so as they were removing guy wires, it fell down. One of them died. Another you know, the one got severely injured in the process. Not, not a good thing. Now, they also take the same stress of climbing up on your roof as to climbing a tower. Now, I am the kind of guy, and I've grown up with this, where and I guess my head just didn't climb up there for any good reason all the time. But I'm on my roof at least once a year to clean out leaves and things like that. I'm pretty comfortable jumping up on my roof. And I, ha I have a low enough pitch of a roof that I can just walk up there without any problems and get around in there pretty, e pretty easily. So I'm not too afraid of jumping up on my roof and doing stuff. I'm not too afraid of getting up on a ladder and doing stuff. However, I'm extremely respectful of gravity. And, well, I'm, I, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm extremely respectful of heights. And I am not risking. I'm not a, a person who takes risks and like leaning way over on a ladder. I'd rather move the ladder five inches if it gave me my reach that I needed. So things to think about, though, as you start going down the road of putting up antennas out around your house, if you do. Um, if you're not that kind of person or you just don't want to or can't or don't want to, um, you can just do like a pop-up thing. You can um, There's like multiple different ways you can do stuff like that without having to climb up. Or go up higher, high distance, high ranges, high distances, whatever. So back to the subject in the book, uh, tower climbing and safety. So 
while you may not immediately decide to put up a tower yourself, it's common for amateurs to help each other with it with antenna projects. Um, starting with a, with a personal preparation, both climbers and ground crew should wear appropriate protective gear anytime work is underway on the tower. Each member of the crew should wear a hard hat, goggles, or safety glasses, and heavy-duty gloves suitable for working with ropes. If you are the climber, use an inspected and improved climbing harness, fall or, or fall arrester, and work boots to protect the arches of your feet. Don't use a leather lineman's belt as they are unsafe and no longer proof for tower work. Many climbers prefer footwear with steel shank that supports a foot while standing on narrow rung. Others, a properly equipped cl- climber ready for, oh, then they, they show a uh, actual climber ready for tower work. Um, then they say, before you climb, inspect the tower guiding and support hardware, repair or tighten as necessary before anyone goes up. That one ham I mentioned, they didn't check they must not have checked that or thought it was good. Uh, you know, who knows? And probably never will. Uh, crank up towers must be fully retracted or or mechanical safety locking devices have been installed. Never climb up a crank up tower support only by the cable that supports the sections. Probably not a smart idea. Double chuck all your climbing belts. Make sure all ropes and low bearing hardware are in good condition. Use a gin pole, a temporary mask to lift materials such as antennas and tower sections. So you have to hoist them up directly. Uh, Double check the latest weather report. You don't want to be in a tower when a thunderstorm comes up. Uh, It's a good idea. (laughs) It's a good idea to visit the bathroom before starting your climb and don't forget the sunblock lotion. (laughs) Oh, well, I guess if you're climbing up 250 feet up to some of our like club towers or club antennas probably an important thing it probably takes you a good half hour hour to just to climb up there so i guess that would make sense uh always make sure you have a crew minimum of, of one other person depending upon what you're doing uh in some cases you want it you probably want a bigger crew than that and uh, in some cases, or more than likely, you probably want to carry your handheld radio with you because if you're up too high, then you can also communicate with people again. Um, for more information um, on mobile installation, so it's a little bit, it's a lot safer actually, <clears throat> but you have different consideration. First, you want to make sure your equipment is secure so nothing starts flying around or anything like that. Um Make sure your antenna is secure so it doesn't like fly off and, well, then that's being a spear at 80, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, probably not a good thing. <clears throat> um, it says don't operate in heavy traffic, pull over to make complicated adjustments on to the radio, and so on. So, as I have, like I kind of led into, this is. This should be good sense stuff. Now, my guess is I probably would not have thought to buy a full climbing gear for a 40-foot tower. It's like, well, it's 40 feet, not that big of a deal. But as I hear more and more about this, I was like, okay, that might be actually a good idea. Because you can clamp yourself right to the tower so you can't fall. You're not sitting up there trying to hold on and work with, you know, one hand to do some of this stuff. You actually have two free hands that you can work work with whatever you're trying to do. Um, you know, things like that. So um, that becomes important to to know and to have that uh, capability. Yeah. So that. Um, that pretty much wraps up the book. The only thing beyond that is chapter 10 is the glossary. That's covering terms. I try to cover many of them throughout the process. And then chapter 11 is the actual question pool. So the actual question pool is kind of interesting. It's something you, um, well, actually question pool. Yeah, there we go. So the first part of the question pool is just kind of talking about the different sections. And then what's beyond that is the actual test. 
So within these test questions is um, they actually have the answer written right in the back of the book with uh, everything else. So these questions are literally what is on the test, word for word. They don't trick you with changing up the ABCDs and the wording within there. The wording and everything is consistent. <clears throat> but the order of the answers may not be consistent. So question T1A01. What is the following? What which of the following is the purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? So they have A, B, C, and D. And if you look, so these wordings, the order might be different, but the words are all the same. You go, you look to the right of the question and or left of the question, depending on which page you're on. They have, again, the, the question number. In parentheses, they have the answer. So in this case, it was C, advancing skills in the technical and communication phases of the radio art. They have the, I think that is the actual, the, the 97.1 is the actual section within the FCC code. You can find this listed. And then they have which page it is on, and or which chapter, page, chapter, 7-2. So I guess that'd be page within the within the chapter. Um where you can find this question and read more about it. So this is kind of your last step in um, studying for your technician license. What I did, and uh, I'm going to cover this today. What I did was I first read the book cover to cover. I started out with the uh, ebook and quickly realized that for studying, I mean, for one thing, just read through it. The ebook was just fine. However, once you started studying, all of a sudden you're flipping pages, you're going back and forth. Well, how do I get back to 2 5? It became more of a struggle. So, what I ultimately did was I bought the paper copy, and that's what I would suggest you buy. Just get the paper copy right away, the dead tree copy. As you read it, each Within the words, there is bold text with what the question number is. So you might see T3B01. I highlighted that. So now when I'm going back through the book and I could switch to 7-3 or 7-2, now all of a sudden here's T0, T1A01 that I was looking for before. And here, and then I can read around it, see what the answer is. So that was the first thing I did was I, and I didn't really look through the question pool in the back that, that was just too daunting for me. So what I did then was, um, I started with an app. It was okay, but there's just some, something weird about that. I just couldn't keep using it consistently. So then I went to qrz.com and they have a ham test out there. So you have to register, but then after you register, and it says you need a call sign or you can register as a, 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 a non-call sign. So what you do is you sign up as a non-call sign so you can take the ham test and you can browse around the site and everything else too a little bit. Um, and then, um, but you start doing their, te their ham test there. And I can put a link to that in the show notes here. So you constantly take the, the, the ham test. Um, once you consistently are getting around 85 percent 80 to 85 i would say then you're ready um for the tech license i purposely took the test multiple times until i had every single question um i guess i was just over cautious maybe um but then when i did the um the um oh man general test when i studied for general test I use the same platform, but I I did that a little bit differently. Um, I, I read the entire book cover to cover. Then I jumped right into testing within there. And um, I didn't hit every single question. Probably three, at least 300 of the 400, some three, maybe 350, somewhere around there of the total number of questions. And then once I... Um, 
was constantly getting about that 80 to 85 percent said okay now i'm ready um and then i took him past both so that is pretty much the approach i'm going to take when i take when i go for the extra at some point in my life and um use that approach so i think this is um a decent approach and hopefully it works for other people as well not everyone works the same way um the the other thing i did do was i watched a video series from uh, KE0OG um he is david castler he has a series of youtube videos some of them like, okay, this is kind of worthless, but then others were really helpful, um, especially when he demonstrated on the, on the air, in the video, um, that, like doing communications with people, uh, doing digital modes, showing a TT, TTY, Riddy, or Riddy, TT, uh, Riddy, or whatever. He, he demonstrated some of these modes of how it actually works. So then you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. He showed, he demonstrated grounding to his um, antenna or his antenna mast. He showed some of his antennas and how he rode into his house a little bit. Um, he demonstrated, I think he demonstrated, I don't remember everything he demonstrated, but he his series is overall pretty good. Um, the the tech license, I'm not sure if it's his grandson or what, but he has another kid doing some of the videos, at least the introduction. But mo he has a lot of content that gets recycled from older. So you kind of see him bounce around between uh, looking younger to looking older to having this other kid on there. When I start going through, like, this is kind of weird, but the content is there. And that's co content is king, as we know in podcasting. So I highly recommend um, watching his videos. I will, again, link to that in the show notes as well. Um, Henry Crash Course, I cannot vouch for that. He also has a series on that, and his live streams are focused on, a lot of his live streams are focused on either existing people, learning new things, or just new people, or, you know, new people to ham radio, learning new things. And he also has, like, a go through the tech license, manual, training, something or something like that. Again, I have not vetted that one, so I'm not going to vouch for it, but I, I'll link to it because... It's good to have resources, and you never know if one thing doesn't click with you, another one might. Um, tech license is, you know, probably the most important if you're in an area where you can get uh, natural disasters. Uh, Florida right now, with the hurricanes coming, would it be very useful to have um, tech license? And some sort of a radio, because then you can talk to people. You can say, hey, I am. I have water coming in my house. I need evacuation now. Hurricane is probably the single biggest one. And then the next one after that, after that is probably um, earthquake, uh, uh, tsunami type, type scenarios probably, uh, where... They come out of nowhere and potentially could leave a lot of destruction behind. And ham radio infrastructure will always be there. Um, e you know, even if it's just a simplex kind of a thing, you just, you know, obviously got to work with the area and to know exactly what you need to, um, to get on and start communicating. Um, join your club at the bare minimum, join your club. Uh, mine is 30 bucks a year and I have every time I try and go to a, um, a, a club meeting, it's actually a social gathering and there's just nothing formal. It's like, well, I'm not going to say, well, here's my $30. I want to pay. And they don't have anything that they're like bringing, they're not bringing paperwork and stuff. They're bringing food. So 
I haven't formally joined yet, but I have said I, I will be joining. Uh, that also helps offset costs of probably your re- local repeaters. Most of them are c- club funded, I'm, I would imagine, rather than uh, personally, although some people probably personally do, do have some of those. Um, yeah, I think that kind of covers the bulk of what you need to do. Now, whether you join the ARRL or not, that is up to you. Um, on one hand, they will, you know, it's much like many other organization or even, dare I say it, like a union or something like that. They are there to vouch for you because I mean, it's a volunteer. Ham radio is a whole bunch of volunteers. So together... There isn't, I mean, there's money behind it because obviously we buy a lot of stuff, but there's not really, you know, a formal structure to go and report and complain to the FCC that something is, you know, we don't like what's happening. The ARRL is our voice in that. And um, I'm sure they take feedback from their members somehow and that kind of stuff. I haven't been around them long enough to do that. In fact, there was in France a proposal, and I don't remember exact frequencies. There's two, two, a two megahertz range within the two meter section. Um, come on, brain. Let me look at my sheet here. My old cheat sheet. I think they wanted like one four five and one to one four seven or something like that for bands for aeronautical type communications, and France proposed that to their local controlling group. Uh, They needed like three people to shut them down. Only one person voiced concern against that at that particular point. So then it moved on. Well, all of a sudden the ham community just blew up because they're taking away or they're taking away your stuff, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you read what they actually were proposing, they were proposing kind of a shared which everyone was correct in the ham radio, it wasn't going to work because put yourself up 20 miles. Well, heck, we've talked about satellites. You put yourself up in the air, your reach is a lot more. And as I understand, these aeronautical ones were for much higher than that. I, even space, I thought. I can't remember. I can't remember the exact. I think All I know is aeronautical. Um, so now you're talking about huge swaths of area where these bands would probably be unusable because it's cluttered by the aeronautical traffic that can take up an entire country through the conversations because of the range. Um, not a good idea. Um, so between the ARRL and various organizations, all that represent ham radio throughout, it was finally shut down here today. I think the the news article came out and I think previous to that, it was, uh, it was about the time I got my license. So about June. So what, three months later, it got shut down. Uh, so that's probably why it's worth to do that kind of a thing. Now, ARR, ARRL is 50 bucks a year, but you also get the magazine. So, you know, you can justify it however you want. But if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. I mean, that's what it is. If I was to choose between ARRL and the local, and the local one, I would choose the local one. Because the local one is local. They're the people you're talking to. They're the equipment that you're using. They have real costs that that um, you probably need help, or that they need probably need help paying for. The ARL is national. They got everyone around the nation. They won't miss one amateur. And it sounds sound like not everyone's a member anyway. So I won't be too concerned about that. It's just another sales pitch. Um, I bought into it. If I find it's a waste at some point, I'll stop. Um, yeah, this is getting me a long one here, but just want to make sure I wrap everything else up and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do tomorrow. 
Um, well, I think I'm going to just cut it off here then and uh, call it done. We have gone through the entire manual. I had my a few specials of uh, where to start for radio and antennas and uh, just in general, like software, that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're good. Um, if you're really interested in more about ham radio, you can follow the HRCC ham radio crash course. It's on YouTube. Uh, Josh does a pretty good uh, job on um, explaining things. It gets a little um, distracted sometimes, though. Uh, it's a little, it's a different way of, of watching, but he's kind of watching his comments and answering to people right right away in there while he's talking about his content. And it's very much like squirrel, 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 squirrel. But ultimately, he is showing you things, and he does finish up what he's talked about. So it's worth looking at and listening to. In fact, uh, t- tonight he covered um, oh, how, how to call, or con- calling protocols, I think is what it was, or something like that. So he really was talking about, you know, how do you call CQ? Well, and his just yeah, what he said was, and it makes sense now. If you're on repeater, and I I know I've said this, but if you're on a repeater, you don't call CQ. You are on a repeater. If someone answers, they'll answer you. You're not seeking someone. People are probably listening. Um, if you're on simplex frequencies, you can call CQ because it's not well defined, and you could really be any spot in calling. So it's probably better to call CQ on that. And he also said he uses the phonetic when he does that. Well, more so on HF, but he he sometimes will do that in simplex as well for um, just to help find people a little better. Um, And then he did also put in there that sometimes local areas will have a defined simplex where everybody talks. And then he doesn't or then he doesn't call CQ on that. So it's kind of just learning the protocols and stuff and that. And that's with just about anything in this area. The book can only talk so much. And then, you know, they, they say, well, this is a standard. And then you come into an area and say, that's not our standard. This is how we've done it. This is how we've always done it. We're not changing how we're doing it. Like, oh, uh, oh, okay. So uh, from here, it's an adventure. Uh, once you take your read, read your book, take your test, and pass. Now the real learning begins. I always say I, I have been saying I have book smart. I know what the book says. I know what the theories are. I don't know how it actually works. So that brings us to this is basically the wrap up of the series. I will fit, have some sort of something for tomorrow. Hoping I can do a, a video because um, that'd be kind of cool to wrap it up with, with actually installing an antenna and actually calling, well, not necessarily a CQ, but hitting a repeater that I can't hit with my standard radio. So that's my hope. And if I can hit um, the next town over, with my radio, I will be happy. So, um, have a good night and or good day, one morning, whenever you're listening to this. And if you're at DragonCon, have a blast. I really hope someday I can join you. And I will talk to you tomorrow. So, uh, this is WX0MIK. And keep wearing those pajamas. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK73